we all know we should drink some more water and most of us don't drink enough water. And, you know, we think of it as hydration so we don't get cramping and we can perform better in the heat. And that's all true. But how many of you have ever wondered whether or what role hydration plays in your heart health? Well, if you've raised your hand and said you've you've asked that question, then today is for you. And I hope that it helps you understand uh, at a deeper level how hydration and why hydration is helpful for your heart and uh, the overall cardiovascular system. And so what I'm going to do is draw a bunch of graphics for you today, because what we've been taught about water, you know, in high school and in middle school um, is, is somewhat true. But over the last couple of decades, there's been a lot of uh, further research done on water that kind of helps explain some phenomena that we can't really answer with the status quo water knowledge that we have. And so if you're interested in, in that stuff, there's a great researcher named Dr. Gerald Pollack that's been doing research on water for decades. And a lot of the information I'm going to give you today comes from his material. And he's written a book called The Fourth Phase of Water. So I'd recommend you check that out. And I've made a video on that in the past, but it's been uh, over a year, probably over two years. And so the the research has in the in our knowledge about things has increased since then. And so I wanted to do an updated one and make it more practical for you because I talk to patients about hydration all the time. And I, I describe it as the easiest hard thing we can do or the hardest easy thing we need to do for our health. Meaning all of us have access to water. The water's free. You know, all we need to do is drink it. But Again, if we all took a survey of ourselves today and said, who on this call has drank enough water today or thinks they have, most of us, if we're being honest, would probably say, nope, I haven't. And so, again, it's the easiest hard thing to do or the hardest easy thing to do. And so hopefully with the information you get today, it will uh, raise the priority for you of how much water you're drinking. So I'm going to jump over to the whiteboard now to draw you some images. Let's first get started with things that we all, you know, already know, so to speak. And if we start with a glass here, we're going to create a glass of water. And When we pour water in the glass, it looks like this. And, you know, most of the water in the glass is what's known as bulk water, meaning it's water right out of your faucet, okay? But for water to, to uh, help us or, or be useful for physiology, we need it to change phase. And here's one of the things that, you know, our, our education on water is kind of behind the times in terms of what we learn in, in preschool and in high school and even in college biology classes, is we're taught that there's three phases of water. And those phases are listed as gas or vapor, liquid, and solid. Right, and the example of solid water would be ice. The example of liquid water would be, again, water that we're familiar with, and vapor would be steam, or gas would be steam. But as Dr. Gerald Pollack says in his books, and he said for decades in his research, there's actually a fourth phase of water, and the fourth phase of water is the phase that is most um, important biologically for us. And that's a gel phase, uh, which is known in Dr. Pollock's research as EZ water. And EZ stands for exclusion zone. And this will make more sense for you in a little bit. But the gel phase of water is 
what uh, allows us to live. And if you think about it, you know, if if you've ever ever um, worked or seen, if you've ever injured yourself where you bled a lot um, or your child's had an injury or you've worked in a hospital where someone maybe had a stab wound or a gunshot wound or a, a big traffic accident where they had a compound fracture or something, you know, these things, if if um, the water in the body were in liquid phase, you'd see a ton of liquid on the floor when someone were stabbed or someone were shot or someone had a compound fracture or a serious injury, right? But you don't see that, okay? There's, there's never this huge puddle of water under an injured person. Yeah, there might be some blood, but, you know, if our bodies are 60 to 70% water, then, you know, putting a hole in your body should result in a gush of water out of the body. And we don't see that, okay? And the reason for that is because the water in our bodies is more gel than it is liquid, okay? It's in this easy, easy water type of um, face. And so what is that? Well, like I said, when you pour water into your cup out of your faucet, that water is called bulk water. And whenever you put water in something, you know, so when this water hits the glass, the, the water that's up against the glass, that water is different than the free floating water that isn't touching the glass. Okay, so the water that's touching the glass or up against the glass is different. And what's different about it is when water contacts the glass or contacts aluminum or contacts you know, anything, you put anything in water, the water that's immediately touching the glass or that exclusion body, as Dr. Pollock calls it, goes through a phase change. And what happens is the water molecules form layers against that glass. And they, they, they go from being H2O, which is the bulk water here. So this is H2O. But when they, when they, the water up against the glass or whatever um, substance is holding the water actually aligns in a lattice-like structure that looks like this. Okay, so um, that that lattice work is is more than H two O, and that lattice work is called an exclusion zone because what happens is when you have the combination of the different water molecules into the lattice, you get a bunch of negative charges lining up in the exclusion zone. And then the positive charges all end up out in the bulk water. And the charge differential, the difference between the negative and the positive is what creates the exclusion zone or the easy water. And this easy water, the negative charge is what promotes that gel type phenomenon and makes it slipperier and allows for things to happen that we can't explain, like a cloud forming in the atmosphere. How do all the water droplets know to congregate into a cloud, right? Why don't they just fall out of the sky on their own? Or it allows for, you know, you see, um, I was at the beach this weekend and you see waves crash on the shore. And when the waves crash and the water falls on itself, you see bubbles floating on top of the water for uh, a couple seconds. Well, why why are certain bubbles resting on top of the water that should just it should just join the rest of the water? But until the bubble pops, that bubble's got an exclusion zone around it. And there's lizards called Jesus Christ lizards that can walk across the top of the water. Well, they shouldn't be able to do that, right? They should fall right through. But uh, these different layers of exclusion zone allow for them to run across the surface. So uh, this exclusion zone occurs because of the container that is holding the water and ambient light. Okay, so let me get a different color. So when we have ambient light hitting the container and hitting the water inside, the ambient light leads to formation of the exclusion zone. And so that ambient light could be the sun, that ambient light could be infrared 
light that's bouncing off your walls or bouncing off you know anything all around us if you if you turned off all light and blocked out the sun in a room and you put on an infrared camera you could see different infrared light intensities bouncing off ourselves bouncing off walls bouncing off monitors all kinds of different things so different uh different spectrum of light ranging from ultraviolet to the visual light to infrared light all impact the exclusion zone and dr pollock's research has shown that the infrared wavelengths actually uh, cause the exclusion zone to be larger when you shine the light on it and when you when you pull the light away it shrinks back down to what it was naturally so um, all of this will make more sense in a couple of minutes but i want you to just understand that when you're drinking water what you think of as bulk water actually contains exclusion zone water or easy water and the easy water is the healthy water and that applies to our physiology as well and we're going to dive into how and why in a moment but first let me change um so the, the before we dive into the physiological part let's go back to drawing a battery here okay and so in a battery and forgive me i believe the positive end is this end of a battery and the negative end is that way um but if i'm wrong it doesn't really matter all you need is a positive and a negative end okay and so dr pollock and dr stephanie seneff who's a phd at mit brilliant researchers have uh, come to discover that water is basically a battery when you have light around okay so if we if we make this a water battery all right pretend this is a water battery or a battery made of water just for you visually okay when um when charge runs through okay charge runs through that creates energy and when you separate charges over here in the water that creates energy so by light hitting water and you get charge separation that creates energy um, or or which can be used to do work it creates potential energy and so uh, dr pollock talks about how we have an unlimited free energy source on this planet called water that makes up 70 percent of the planet that we could harness to do things like uh run you know machines or desalinate the oceans to provide clean drinking water for people and other things like that and so when you have uh, charge separation and things flowing from one charge to the other that produces energy which can be used to do work and the battery that is water is driven by sunlight so the sunlight causes the charge separation so that there can be energy okay so now if we move to a human so to us why does this matter for us well th let's think about it um, from a circulatory system standpoint well no um how do i want to do this now let's go on a cellular level first Oop. So if we have a human cell here, a human cell is, you know, it's got a membrane and it contains water with a bunch of stuff in it. Okay. So inside your cell, you've got a nucleus with DNA in there. Okay. You've got mitochondria, which are the powerhouses of the cell. These guys make the energy for us. You've got these weird things called Golgi bodies and endoplasmic reticulum and lysosomes and all kinds of things. Okay, so the these, these things I drew inside the cell are called organelles. And then out here is the cytoplasm. And the cytoplasm is basically fluid or water that the organelles float around inside. And the fact that you've got these cell membranes around the organelles these are these are these organelles are things suspended in water. So because they're in the water, 
of the cell, they create exclusion zones. So these are surrounded by negative charges, all these things, okay? And then between the negatives are positives. And again, when you've got positives and negatives, that can be a battery or can be used to do work. And if you shine light on this cell, like light from the sun, okay, it could be sunlight, it could be infrared light from the sun or from a laser. And we've talked on previous videos how lasers increase energy of the cell. One mechanism by what, which that works is the infrared light increases the size of the exclusion zones around these different bodies, increase, increasing the difference in charge differential from negative to positive, increasing your ability to do more work. So literally being well hydrated and exposed to light increases your energy as a human being. And who hasn't had, you know, kind of a, a sluggish day who, you know, gets out of work and goes out to the lake or goes out to the beach and all of a sudden feels more energized, right? You're out in the sun, you're being energized from the sun. You might be in the water, which, which also grounds you and adds negative ions from the earth. And you get, you get this big, you know, change in charge differential in your physiology. And all of a sudden you have more energy, you feel better. And what you love the lake, you love the beach, right? We like to go out and be in nature near water. And that's because water, you know, water carries life in the form of energy. And so Another thing we learned in biology was about plants, All right? So let's make a plant here. And plants, uh, let's make it, there's a bad flower, okay? But plants do something called photosynthesis, right? The sun hits the plant, and inside the plant, the plant has um chloroplasts these green things and the light hits the chloroplasts and photosynthesis happens and the plant turns that light energy into uh energy that the plant can use well the first step of photosynthesis is when the sunlight hits water inside the chloroplast and breaks that water up into H positive and OH minus. Okay, so the first step in photosynthesis or energy production or life for the plant is it has to receive sunlight, which takes water, which is neutral. Okay, there's no net charge for H2O and breaks it up into H positive, OH negative. So now there's a difference in charge. Okay, and remember that charge different difference can be used to do work, create energy allow the plant to do what plants do. Okay, well, Dr. Gerald Pollack has shown that the same thing occurs in humans, okay? When the sun hits a human, sunlight hits a human. So say you have uh, veins on the back of your hand that you can see, right? And the sun hits the veins on the back of your hand all right, those veins are carrying blood and blood is basically water with, with cells floating around in it. And remember inside the cells, the cells are little packets of water with other things floating around in them. So Dr. Pollock has shown that when sunlight hits the human being, then it does the same thing that it does in the plant. It splits water into H plus and OH minus. It creates that charge differential and creates that little battery moment for us, that moment to be able to make energy. So what's cool is that humans literally photosynthesize as well. They, 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 we also undergo that first step of photosynthesis. And so we get energy from the sun and that energy from the sun can power our cells. And we are just a bag of trillions of cells. So if we're powering our cells with sun energy and its effect on our water, then we can power ourselves or power our whole organism, our whole being. And so why does this matter for the heart? Good question in the cardiovascular system. 
Well, this information I'm about to give you comes from Dr. Thomas Cowan, and he's a medical doctor uh, that's written multiple books, and I highly recommend you check out his work as well. Um, but he asked the question back in medical school, you know, how does the circulatory system work, right? Because we were all taught that the heart is a pump and the heart pumps blood, you know, into the arteries, which are elastic and pump the blood down into the capillaries. Oops. And then the capillaries, that's oxygenated blood, right? And then the oxygen leaves the red blood cells in the capillaries and goes to tissues. And now we have uh, unoxygenated blood entering the veins and going back to the heart. Okay, so this is a simple graphic of the cardiovascular system. Well, you know, and we're all taught in middle school and high school and college that the heart is a pump and that, you know, if the heart doesn't pump, the blood doesn't move. Uh, but what Dr. Cowan asked early on in his education was, well, this doesn't really make sense because the heart isn't strong enough to pump blood throughout the body. And if you're if the heart was going to be a pump um, from an engineering standpoint, where the heart is up here, you know, up in the chest of a human being is a bad location because it's, it doesn't have the right leverage to to pump blood down from the feet back up to the head. If you want to pump things from the feet back to the head, the best place to put the pump would be in the feet. Right. And so, you know, he asked his his resident, uh, his, his presiding professors and doctors over him. And basically they said, stop asking questions. Um, but he, he, you know, he learned to not ask those questions in school, but he went on to research that himself. And so what he's found with uh, the work of Dr. Pollock and Stephanie Seneff and his own, uh, his own learning is that the blood is not necessarily, is not really a pump the blood is a holding chamber, or excuse me, the heart is not necessarily the pump. The heart is a holding chamber for the blood. And what happens is, you know, you've heard of systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Systolic is uh, the, the so-called pumping, okay? Or when the heart so-called pushes the blood out of itself, okay? Diastolic is the resting phase of the heart, okay, or the filling phase. And so rather than look at the heart as a, uh, you know, a, the, a metaphor for the heart as a pump, Dr. Cowan says we should look at it as a, as a holding chamber where essentially in, in the diastolic phase, it's filling. And when it's filling, it's expanding to a point where it can no longer hold more. Right, and once it once it can no longer hold more, that that um, that filling moment leads to the systolic portion, which basically the uh, the heart dumps the blood down the arteries, and the oxygenated blood is negative, net negative pH, okay, or net negative charge. So you've got negative charge flowing downstream gets to the capillaries and as the red blood cells are going through the capillaries they're shedding negative so you've got red blood cells traveling through capillaries here as they travel through the capillaries they're shedding ox oxygen to the tissues and this thing called sulfate as well and by getting rid of those they become a more net positive charge and veins are positive. Okay, so the difference in charge helps with um, moving the capillaries through, but also the capillaries are moving the red blood cells through the capillaries. The, the capillaries are narrow, the red blood cells are big relative to the capillaries. So as they're moving through and they're moving through this charge difference, they're also releasing an electromagnetic field. And that electromagnetic field results in an enzyme called endothelial nitric oxide synthase or ENOS being released. And ENOS is a vasodilator, 
So what it does is when this red blood cell is shedding its oxygen and sulfate, it's creating an electromagnetic field around itself. And that field is theorized um, by Dr. Seneff to release ENOS. ENOS dilates the vessel and allows the red blood cell to more easily flow out and through and up the venous system back to the heart. So um, what does water have to do with this? Okay, if we take this capillary and we draw it, uh, instead of looking at it from a side view, if we look at it straight on, we've got the capillary here, we've got a red blood cell traveling through it, and I shrunk the red blood cells just so I can show you other things that are in the capillary. And this red blood cell, member is a bag of water, and it's surrounded by an exclusion zone of negative charge. Okay, and then this capillary, all of your blood vessels are lined with things called um, glycosaminoglycans. Just think of them as little trees. And those little trees that surround the whole capillary, I'm not gonna draw all of them, but they are everywhere around here. Those things are made, have sulfate molecules on them and they also have negative charge. Okay, so you've got this exclusion zone or this easy water around the border of the capillary and around the red blood cell. So then everywhere else in there, you've got positive charges. Okay, and that allows for the red blood cell to travel smoothly through the capillary and through the blood vessels. The more, the healthier, the, the more water we have and the healthier water we have in the form of exclusion zones, um, the more smoothly our blood can flow because it's like going down a, a slippery a vessel, okay? If you lose glycosaminoglycans, you lose sulfate, you're not well hydrated, now that vessel can be sticky and red blood cells and other things can stick to that vessel wall. And now maybe you start to develop a clot in that wall or a plaque in that wall. And that starts to occlude that blood vessel, right? And if you occlude that blood vessel, there's less space for things to flow. And when you get occluded enough or plaqued or blocked enough, that could lead to um, ischemic heart attack or ischemic stroke, or maybe the plaque ruptures and blocks it and you, you have a cardiovascular event. So it's very important that we have nice, smooth vessel flow, nice, uh, smooth flow in our blood and remember blood is mostly water and so if that water is properly charged and has good exclusion zones we have healthier and better function and so a key to this all happening to to bring it home for you because i know this is a lot and i'm sorry if i haven't communicated as as best as i uh should have there but the take home here if we let's uh Let's make this our take home. So take home notes is we must hydrate well, okay? We must hydrate well, but, and that looks like, you know, you, you've heard things like half your body weight in ounces for how much water you need each day. And that's a good kind of baseline thing to shoot for. But hydration in and of itself isn't enough because just plain hydration, is dumping bulk water down inside you, okay? And again, bulk water isn't very useful to us unless the bulk water is turned into easy water, you know, you're just gonna urinate it out 45 minutes later. So we need to turn our bulk water into easy water. And how do we do that? Remember the, the first thing and most important thing for us, you know, in the history of humanity is sunlight because historically humans were walking around outside with maybe a loincloth on, but otherwise getting a ton of sunlight. And that sunlight turns bulk water into easy water. And easy water is the healthy, more uh, fourth phase gel-like water that promotes healthy physiology 
acts as that battery for us, provides energy for our cells to perform the functions they need to perform. So light is huge. A third strategy to promote um, lots of negative ions in your body to promote healthy, easy water is grounding. So again, the earth has a net negative charge and negative ions are what promote the easy water, the healthy water, right? So what happens when you're grounding is you go barefoot and you walk in the grass or you walk on the beach or you walk in wet grass or along the where the water meets the sand at the beach, you are pulling up negative ions through your feet from the earth. And so you're literally grounding yourself. You're providing substrate for easy water and for a healthier cardiovascular system and overall uh, physiology. So those are three big time things that you can do for free. Drink water, get proper sunlight and ground yourself. And then Dr. Pollock has also looked at different substances um, that can promote increased easy water. And two big ones that he found were turmeric and ghee. So these are two things that you can ingest that increase easy water for the short term, you know, while while they're while they're in the body for you. I'm sorry, um, turmeric and what? Ghee. Clarified butter. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, the three easy things would be drink the water, get in the sunlight so it's converted to easy water, and then ground or reconnect with the earth so that you've got lots of negative ions available. Um, and those are those are all things that I've used with patients over time that at various points have made big differences for different people. You know, maybe one person said, hey, I got a grounding mat and this has made a huge difference for me. Um, some people said, hey, I, I've started an infrared sauna and now I have so much more energy, right? Um, so, you know, you need to be hydrated, but if you're not getting the proper sunlight and or proper grounding and exposure to nature, you're still lacking some of the tools necessary to be as healthy as possible. From a global physiology standpoint, a cellular standpoint, and a cardiovascular standpoint. So I hope this at least piqued your interest to check out Dr. Gerald Pollock, Dr. Stephanie Seneff, and Dr. Thomas Cowan, and so that you can learn more about the importance of water for your health beyond just the lip service we give it.